Oh, 24 people. Right, welcome, everybody, uh, to the Board of Selectmen uh, meeting for Monday, December 20th at 7 p.m. Please all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. To the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we get Kevin's habits here. Um, so, uh, going back to um, Second item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the December 7th, 2021 meeting. Second. And any amendments or changes to the minutes? I, I just have, um, when we're talking on number seven, I uh, about the charter, the charter, extend the charge of the charter review. We're here, if the date is March 31st, 2022, I think you've got to update that from 21. I think it's in, it's in there twice. So for next March, was we extended it to next March, March, right? Now. Okay. Okay. So um, any other comments or amendments? Proposed amendments? Okay. With that, then I guess uh, all in uh, favor of approving the minutes as amended by Mr. Loretta, all say hi. Please. Hi. 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 Okay. Great. Minutes are approved. Uh, for his first select woman's update, I think I'll just keep this quick tonight. Um, obviously, we've seen um, a, a big rise in COVID in the state of Connecticut and in the country. Um, we've um, seen the Omicron uh, virus uh, now present in our town and in the state. Um, the town um, will be putting in a mask requirement again for all town facilities starting January 3rd. I think with the understanding that a lot of people are going to be coming back from large gatherings over the holidays um, and traveling. And so we, as a precaution, are going to implement it for the month of January and see where uh, the numbers are. This is once again for just town facilities. We kind of took a break starting uh, in November and we're starting to see a rise again. So that will be in place um, uh, starting January 3rd. Um, and just also want to wish uh, everybody uh, a happy holidays um, and, you know, to enjoy the next couple of weeks. And that's my update. Um, and I guess I could report quickly on the town meeting as well. Um, the special appropriation regarding the purchase of the Jansen property. We held a special town meeting um, at 6 o'clock uh, this evening and the form was not achieved. Uh, so the motion automatically passed. And so the next step in that process will be um, the board selectmen will be voting on January 11th to send um, the school renewal plan and as well as the academy proposal um, and potentially the um, sale of Island Avenue uh, on January 11th uh, to a public referendum for, to be scheduled for February 15th. So that's my update. Any other selectmen reports, comments? I have a couple. Um, so from the Board of Ed standpoint, um, we have, do you want me to use that? Yeah, um, uh, is that better? Yes. All right. We have, uh, from a board of ed perspective, we have five new board members um, and the committee work is up and running at this point. So they're pretty excited about that. There was a budget presentation on January 4th. Uh, so be advised about that. And um, on that January 4th meeting, there'll be a brief update on the school renewal plan. Uh, there'll be a presentation that night. Uh, the board received an enrollment report presentation on December 14th. That is uh, on the website. The information is out there. And then obviously, um, a bit of a hot topic, even this evening, uh, the school renewal plan referendum is currently slated for February 15th. So that is the Board of Ed. And then if I can toggle here to my Madison News and Family Services update. I received this from Scott, so I'm just going to read it. Uh, it's just easier. Uh, Madison Youth and Family Services is wishing everyone a safe and happy holiday season. Uh, Madison Youth and Family Services will follow the town holiday schedule for office closures, and we have a variety of resources listed on our town web page, including a phone number to reach us for urgent matters. Madison Youth and Family Services has the results from our biannual high school survey conducted last fall. We are rolling out a series of presentations. Um, Youth and Family Services is scheduled to do a virtual presentation on the data 
um, to the PTO on Tuesday, January 4th at 8.30 a.m. and we'll schedule a virtual community presentation in early February that will include a panel of high school students. Generally speaking, the data shows some clear areas of strength within our community and re reinforces the areas where students have already expressed concerns. We encourage the Madison residents to attend at least one of our community presentations. The survey results demonstrate the decline in rates of our youth self-report substance abuse, however, an increase in mental health problems, including eating disorders. We also will share data on student self-report of sexual harassment and assaults. If there are any residents who would like to have more input on Madison and Family Services programs and services, we currently have two openings on our board, on our advisory board, and residents can reach out to the director, Scott Cochran, or board chair, David Buller, with any questions or interest. Or me, I am the liaison. End of report. Over you. I just want to report one thing with the Madison Youth Services. I am looking for people to come on, so I see some younger parents. Anybody would like to get on, really appreciate it. When Scott Corcoran mentions all the different things that our kids are dealing with, that's what this advisory board should be doing. And I think that's why I think if we get them more involved in things like that, I've talked to Scott about it. I think people feel like it's an advocacy, advocacy group and it's not what they want to do. But when I hear that, that's what our parents should be working on, the, 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 the unbelievable stress of all those different issues, whether it be you know eating disorders or drink and drugs, um, and certainly uh, suicide, um, sexual abuse, awareness, everything. Um, so we need parents to get involved and we need to pick parents to, in, to insist that our youth services and our schools work on all those things with us. Mental health is a huge problem. Um, senior services, um, we, um, they've been having a real hard time with their buses um, being vandalized. They've actually lost four catalytic converters last month. This is the third time it's happened. And what it does is bad enough it's the money, it actually puts the buses that are needed by our, by our seniors um, out of commission. So we have suggested to Austin that he consider maybe not leaving the buses at the senior center at night. Maybe we can find some place over Jack's area, Jack Drum's area over there. Um, but, but, but so far, but anyway, I want to wish everyone Merry Christmas also. Happy holidays. Uh, the Board of Police Commissioners was pleased to uh, review the statistics on criminal activity in Madison because, as, as I understood those statistics, the, uh, they, they were headed downward, uh, a favorable trend. Uh, Chief Drum also reported that some of the suspects involved in some of the criminal activity that took place uh, over the summer, uh, some of them had been apprehended, as I understand. So. That was good news for the Board of Police Commissioners. Well, I just want to say happy holidays to everybody. My uh, liaison uh, groups have been quiet, so I have nothing to, to add. Great. Uh, we have a number of people here in the audience, uh, so we can open up the public comment and then we'll do the in person first and then move on to the people if there's anybody in Zoom. So, anybody here for public comment? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the product. Um, I read that uh, on a post from Norah to the river that, that I read I read that the board selectmen has chosen to not renominate some members of the planning and zoning committee because they were unwilling to say that they would none of them would run for a chair. And so the, the board, or at least the first select woman, chose to not, not renominate those people, to simply say, no, you must do it my way or the highway. And this is this is unacceptable in this town. We have a town that works very well in terms of balanced approach, just as you have three and two members up here on the uh, board of selectmen, 
We've had a mix of all our boards and committees throughout this time, and to begin to dictate, we are not going to allow uh, for a balanced approach on this is unconscionable. It's 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 dictatorial, and um, this this is not going to go away quietly. This is going to be something we're going to bear out and. You're going to hear about this for a while. So this is this is unacceptable. We have a balanced town. We want to want representatives all the time, not just in your party. So thank you. Thank you for your comment. Any other public comment? Yep. I've been a citizen of the town of Madison for 30 years. And previously, Ms. Lyons, I asked you. If you had contacted any of the people from the state, now, Mr. Crespo in the Wellington garage, Andy Proto from Guilford, and Lino uh, Bruno, general supervisor for the DOT. Now, Put the microphone up to these right? people. Well, basically, I brought it up previously. I'll bring it up again tonight. I'll bring it up all the time. There were certain people for the state that have responsibilities, and I've asked the first select woman to contact these people. For example, we have a tree that's dead at exit 61. It looks like we're in a third world country coming off the exit there. Uh, that's just one of the things. Along Route 79, there are trees that are a danger to the public. I brought up previously the last year. I don't remember whether it was Dairy Ann or Nikina. Two people were killed in one week in one town from falling trees and tree limbs. I've seen nothing done at all along 79 from Green Hill Road south. And I was wondering if you contacted any of these people as a representative of this town to get the state to do something. I pointed out previously, we're not talking about a capital expenditure to get a build the building. We're talking about preserving the lives and safety of people of the town of Madison. That's only one point. I've also asked about signs. A lot of the signs you cannot see because they're faded. Uh, and along with the signs, currently we've got some kids stealing signs. The sign was stolen from Wellesley. And the sign was stolen from this trail. Uh, I would like this uh, board of selectmen to think very seriously about holding parents responsible for the criminal acts of their children. These signs are not cheap insofar as the labor and insofar as the material to meet the signs. And then we have the inconvenience of people not being able to see the streets. And if we hold the parents accountable financially, we may see some changes. This is not a game here where people take signs down and hang them up in their rooms. Uh, it's a serious thing. That's part of it. I've also asked you on behalf of this town to contact the state in regards to lighting on 95, although it is not a function of this board of selectmen to do anything about that. It's the safety of the citizens of this town. Try riding home on 95 from New Haven at night in the dark. I think tomorrow was the uh, shortest uh, day of the year, and also coming from Clinton. In addition to that, we have signs that are obscured by branches all along. If you go up 79, less than a half a mile from 95, there's a sign that says, do not pass. And it's obscured by branches. Now the leaves are off the branches right now, but a couple of weeks ago, one more on went over the double yellow line and round and almost caused that hell of an accident. Uh, his excuse might have been, but I didn't see the sign that says do not pass. And the other thing is another minute, Mr. Wilkins, please. We have a meeting again. So one more minute of public comment. I'll be happy. Yeah. So we have to go we're down, we're down to exit 57 and look at the beautiful sign about entering Dover. It's when you're getting on both north and south from exit 57. 
It's a wonderful sign. I pointed out to you up at Moonaby Circle, there's a sign. Down on the Hamanasa Connector, there's a sign. And if you're coming into the town on 79, there's a sign. All of them are in a state of disrepair. Talks about the historic district. They covered with mildew, and they should at least be washed. I said that before, but uh, just take a look at the sign down there. I mean, this town is like a third great town right now. And I think you need to step up to the plate and do something about it. We're not talking about building buildings, we're talking about maintaining the quality of what we see in this town. And that's why we live here, and that's why we take taxes, and that's why we vote. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other public comment in person? John Rasmus, Governor's Way. Uh, maybe more of a comment than a question, but I'm, I'm just wondering if more can be done to get people involved in the meeting that occurred earlier. Um, I know there's a lot of people that are concerned about this project, projects, and just kind of surprised that more wasn't done to get more people uh, out to a vote on it. Uh, the other thing I'll say is I'm kind of surprised that the minimal state support that we're going to get for these projects. I'm just wondering, I know this is the body that does that, but do we have a plan to uh, work to uh, get more state participation? I opened my property tax bill today and was shocked to find out we get 400 and something thousand dollars back from the state. And it just seems like uh, we need to do more to ensure that all that money that we send to Harvard, Harvard that comes back to help us with these projects and to Help fill the budgets that I think over the next five years are going to be very difficult budgets when we start bonding these projects. So I have a concern about that. Any other uh, public comment? Uh, Mr. Uh, no, for the bonding project, it's yeah. 18%. Right. 18%. 18%. It was 19%. It's 18 or 19%. I want to have a question. Hi, my name is Amy Stefanowski. I live at 1046 Boston Post Road. And um, kindness matters. People matter. Experience matters. People over politics and neighbors serving neighbors. These aren't just campaign slogans that we say in October and then forget about in December. Madison's boards and commissions are our neighbors. They're volunteers who work all day and leave their families and their closing homes at night to serve our community. Trust me, it's not easy to convince people to participate. When we do find these civic minded heroes, we need to treat them fairly. I join many in town, deeply concerned that injecting partisan politics into our appointment process, which I believe is the case tonight, will have a very negative effect on our town as a whole. We need to encourage more people to participate in boards and commissions in Madison, and this sort of blatant partisan politics only serves to lessen public participation, not enhance it. Thank you. Any other comments from people here? Yes. Hi, thank you. My name is Galen Collett. Uh, thank you for all the opportunity for this program. Um, I'm not anti anything, I'm just for good hearted citizens and people, and I think that we are potentially losing two great members of the town's own today. So I want to say thank you. Diane, please state your full name and address for the record. Full name is Diane Zorich. Address is 60 Janice Lane, Madison, Connecticut.
Okay. Yep, you can, yep, you can respond, okay. Um, I just have a simple question. I don't understand why schools are not maintained and why the thought process is let's not maintain the schools, let's just build new ones. Does it make sense? That's my comment. Okay, thank you for your comment. And um, I know there's a lot of information available on the website about the school renewal plan and why they're choosing the plan that they are. Um, so, um, you know, for the public's benefit, there is information on the school plan on the uh, Board of Education as well as the town website. Okay. Um, um, there, there may be information, but the information is very convoluted and very confusing. I consider myself to be a very intelligent person and I find it very difficult to understand the reasoning. So that's why I raised this question. And it's very easy to say, oh, yeah. check into the website and look at the information, but the information is not clear. And the question is, I don't, in other words, if I buy a house and it's in poor disrepair, I don't say, oh, let's knock it down. Let's build another one. I figure out how to fix it. So this thought process makes no sense. Okay, thank you for your comment. Okay, so um, I guess uh, moving on to, and I'd actually like to make a motion to open up the agenda for a new item um, that Lauren sent out to the board. Um, actually, I wanted to also, I thought, just deal with two town issues. So make a mo motion to open up the agenda for a new item, uh, 6A, which is discussed to take action to approve awarding a contract to rechassis a 2011 Dodge PL Custom Ambulance to a new 2022 Ford F550 4x4 chassis to a new England Fire Equipment and FRMs Corporation PL Customer Emergency Vehicles. Total cost not to exceed $192,500. Funding is budgeted in the ambulance vehicle replacement account for 2021 2022. So I'll make that motion first. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. I forgot. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> okay, can we have a vote to open up the agenda to add uh, that as item 6A to the agenda? So, all right. All right. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay, now, um, do I need to read it again? I guess. Uh, okay, now I'd like to make a motion. To discuss and take action to improve awarding a contract for reach as a 2011 Dodge PL custom ambulance to a new 2022 Ford F554 by Ford Chassis to make with fire equipment and apparatus corporation customer emergency vehicles. The total cost not to exceed 192500 Funding is budgeted in the ambulance vehicle replacement account for 2021 2022. Okay. Second. Okay. Um, any uh, discussion? I think we actually have Chris Bernier here online, it looks like. Right, so maybe if you want to uh, have him join the meeting and he can just talk through, this is basically something budgeted and they want to jump and jump on this uh, to lock in some pricing. So Chris, if you just want to let the board uh, do a quick overview and answer questions. Yep, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Chris Bernier, EMS Director for Madison EMS. Everyone can uh, hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yep, so, uh, we wanted to just take advantage before the, the new year and make sure we can lock in this pricing before a number of price increases will likely go into effect. And so as you read, we're looking to reach our 2011 Dodge Ambulance. It's our oldest vehicle in the fleet. Um, and we're gonna be replacing it with a 2022 Ford F550. So basically the reach processes will be taking the existing uh, box off the existing ambulance and putting that on a new, uh, a new Ford chassis. Uh, is, is the overall goal. It's like a remount process. Uh, be the first one that we're going to be pursuing rather than purchasing a whole new vehicle. Uh, the vehicle meets uh, or the box meets our basic needs. And uh, over the last uh, five fiscal years, we've had a lot more expenses on the Dodge ambulance itself. A lot of problems with the diesel exhaust uh, system. And uh, unless there's any specific questions, I'm happy to, to answer anything for you. Any board member questions for Chris? Budget, right? So it's already in the, in the program. Yeah, everything is uh, in our CIP. Uh, we have enough funding to do that. Uh, it's approved in this current fiscal year that we're in now. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. Um, all right. Well, with that, I just ask why this wasn't on the agenda. Um, 
I think he realized that he wanted to get, well, Chris, why don't you explain? It kind of came in literally today, I think. Uh, or just, okay, yeah, after we have posted. Yeah, yeah I'd sent the request in on Thursday. Pardon? I had sent the request in on Thursday um, and I maybe Lauren didn't realize or we didn't realize the exact timing um, and the importance of that so we could maintain the, the budget for it. So I appreciate you opening the agenda and adding this item so we can take advantage of the existing pricing. We're trying to get this, the year end year pricing for 2020. So any other questions? Okay. All right, with that, all in favor of the motion as read, say aye. 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 Okay, no exceptions to the next. Motion passes. All right, moving on. Um, the next item on the agenda is discuss absentee ballot process for February referenda with the town clerk, Nancy Martucci. Nancy, oh, Nancy's here. So, Nancy, if you want to join us. Um, uh, so, basically, um, we had a discussion at our last board meeting about. Um, trying to provide absentee ballot applications uh, for the February 15th referendum. And so, uh, you know, we realized we really needed to, um, we realized we needed to have a conversation about uh, even the feasibility of this, given the timing and the expense and, and some of the complications with that. So Nancy has written a memo to the board to discuss. And um, uh, with that, I will let Nancy kind of walk through some of the issues surrounding this. Okay. And, uh, Thank you. So it actually led to a lot of things um, and, a, and a good learning experience, both for myself and talking with the Secretary of State's office and Elections Enforcement Committee and the Town Clerk Association. So currently, there's no legislation or process for town clerks to follow. Um, as we know, some of us know, in, in the past, the Secretary of State did do this back when COVID was on an application for a reason not to go to the polls. And since then, uh, there were some other towns or uh, major parties that chose to send out applications for the municipal election. Uh, they pre-filled the first portion of it which led to them having to complete section seven that they assisted with completing the application. That has led to complaints with election enforcement for a number of, of reasons. Um, what they're looking at now to make a decision on is, can someone other than the secretary of state pre-fill the absentee ballot application and provide unsolicited assistance and that would mean any information filled in with name, address, date of birth, anything. But that's one of the things that they're looking to, to make an answer on in a decision. Second part of that is, can that section seven be completed with anything other than a wet signature? So, so it puts us sort of in a catch-22. If we send out just an application, we start the process to 13,900 uh, registered electors in town. If we get those back um, without putting a barcode on the top, the town clerk office would be inundated um, and have to do a lot of manual uh, work on that, which we're not prepared for. <laughs> Okay, because we have to actually input all the information to get to the person in what's called the CVRS system, that's the election system through the Secretary of State. So it would be manually entering all that information. If we had a barcode on there, that would help our process because we could scan it when it comes back. However, if we don't pre-fill the person's name and address, in the first section, uh, uh, homeowners or electors at their home could feasibly receive one for every person in their house that could vote. Now they have an application with a barcode and they could easily mix up whose application that is if we don't have the name on there. 
And then it comes back to us and we end up back at square one because we wouldn't be able to do anything with it unless it's correctly completed. Because we'd be scanning in a barcode, but it's not matching the person's name. So it seems that when you're doing that for speed and ease and accuracy, you'd really have to pre-fill. So the question then comes up, what do we do with this section um, seven in signing it? And the Secretary of State clearly said you have to have a wet signature there. Um, there's also that the fact that COVID is not on the application at this time. So we would have to field, and we probably will be fielding calls anyway, trying to explain why COVID's not there this time, and it was in the past. Um, we would also have to follow, uh, it's a statute 9-140. Anyone that, and, and anybody in our office, if we're sending out an application to someone, we have to track that. And again, we have to track the ballot to the person. So an application would have to have a number on it and a sequential list with the uh, corresponding number of who it went to. So we could use a mail company um, to keep track of all that. The cost for um, from one company I received to do this is um, I think it was eleven. It's over eleven thousand dollars. I'm waiting on another larger company to do, that is used to doing this. And it's done many many states. Um, I believe they're going to come in maybe a, maybe a few thousand less, but that's it. So it's it's an enormous cost. It's a big undertaking. The state and um, elections enforcement um, and the town clerks association came back really saying there's no procedure for this right now and you're putting yourself in a situation. If we choose not to sign section uh, seven, um, I you know we could we could end up having complaints on that if we choose not to do that. If we do send out to all the electors that also is putting us in a situation because we're not sending it out to taxpayers in town that could possibly vote. I checked with SEC on that and they didn't have a decision on that except to say it seems to be okay unless there's a complaint that comes through. Then there'd be a complaint that they would have to look at. So we're sort of in the middle of all this. The one thing that I am, um, I think it was proactive and the best thing to do. Our electors are used to in a referendum that we send it, we can only use the application that designates uh, someone to get the ballot for them because the question is called under 30 days. Since this will be called over the 30 day period, it allows my office to use the regular long application, which allows us to mail a ballot to someone. And I think that that's a really uh, great uh, step in the right direction to be able to get this to people this time. And, and uh, a positive thing to call this in more than 30 days. We do have an application on our website right now. Technically they said, you know, a referendum is not a referendum until it's called. So I'm not supposed to act on anything, but we did put it up as proposed and it, it is there if someone wants to fill it out. They can send it into my office. They can use the Dropbox. The Dropbox is now open um, out in front of Town Hall, and we will hold it. And we will be ready uh, once the board calls the question and uh, get the ballots in. Usually, you know, three to four days afterwards, and we will be ready to um, to start addressing any applications that do come in. Okay. Um. I think to highlight, you know, that was a concerted effort in putting the, the timeline together for the February 15th referendum was to ensure that we could have a better absentee ballot process because this was new to me when I heard people who um, the difficulties that they went through in previous referendums in the past um, to get absentee ballots. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that's going to be a huge difference uh, for this referendum because I know a lot of people do, you know, vacation in February or they have places down in warmer climates at times. So this is an opportunity for them even now to, to at least print out and start the application process and they can do that wherever they are. 
Um, so at least there is that extra step that is being offered to um, voters this year. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll, I'll leave this to more discussion now about um, questions on this. I mean, I think we all agree that we want to continue to make it easier for people to vote. So, um, but at the same time, this is a very complex issue. Um, and um, there's going to be a lot of discussion statewide about how we vote. Um, and I just don't know if the town is really in a position right now to kind of be the leading edge of that. So <laughs> um, with that, uh, any uh, more yeah. I would just add that we have to do something. The biggest comment I get is, you know, right away they're so suspect that we picked in the middle of winter um, to have this vote. So let's make people really comfortable. And then you have to add COVID to it and the new surge. And also, well, we've really got to solve this problem. The state, the Secretary of State can make exceptions. Didn't she make an exception this time with the wet signature? No. Because I thought wet signature was used in Madison. The Secretary of State said it was all right. No, I, it would have to be a wet signature, meaning I would have to actually sign in ink. Well, they, they, so they couldn't go through a machine. No, I thought she, I thought she allowed that this time with um, the Guilford case. No, so so that's the question that um, the Elections Enforcement Committee are working on a decision now. It was not a it was not a wet signature. I believe. It was said that they could use a digital signature. Right, some right. Some used digital, um, and some used copied signatures, which were not allowable, and they're making a decision on it, but they haven't yet. So we'll be having more conversation. Obviously, we've got to make a decision. And I know some of these things you suggest are costly, but yeah. people really have, even if they get a notice to go online and get the application, or some just to remind people you saw tonight so many people didn't, didn't know about this meeting this is too important and really want people to know that we're engaged we want them to be engaged so i think thank you for tonight this was a good step but we do have to do more than we've ever done before especially with covid uh, i'd like to follow up noreen's question um uh, nancy you've described a significant extra workload to pursue some of these options. Have you priced out the incremental cost of hire of the additional hours of manpower that's required? Um, so back in um, in the presidential for 2020, <laughs> so during the presidential 2020 election, um, we had gotten grants of $24,000 I believe my office used all of that um, and it didn't even make it um, to for the use of the registrars. It all was used for my office. And that was for about, I think we did just about 7,000 um, applications and ballots. Uh, so, so we're looking at an enormous cost um, and manpower and uh, secured location. Luckily, that was during COVID, and we were able to keep the vault closed, and I was able to use that entire space. Every every counter space in the vault, in addition to extra tables and um, shelving units, were put up in the vault uh, to accommodate that. So this past municipal election, uh, we did about fifteen hundred, and I think you know we did okay. I had some extra hours in my office. What I'm budgeting for next year um, probably is, uh, I think I'm around for the re a referendum and uh, the uh, gubernatorial. Uh, you know, it's close to in the primary. It's about eleven thousand dollars extra just for manpower, um, and and you have to we have to make a guess on that. We just don't know at this point. Is the state putting something out um, with applications? Um, you know, we're not sure. So I really have to make a guess at what this is going to be and the amount that we're going to be doing. I don't anticipate doing what we did in 2020 uh, for the presidential, but I'm figuring, you know, like, like close to it. Keep the microphone. Um, I want to follow up. Uh, keep the microphone. Um, if this served as a precedent, how many uh, episodes per year are there of where we would be sending out these ballots? Three, four? In other words, whatever number you come up with, we would have to, on an annual basis, multiply it by 
three, four. Well, that that eleven thousand dollars about that I'm looking for 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 this coming budget is for three events. So it's it's primary, uh, the November election, and then the uh, the May budget referendum. The, the numbers in here in terms of the oh, this. and uh, uh, absence of balance. Oh, if we were supposed to do right? it, yeah, this is just one. Yeah. Right. Um, so then you have to multiply this for the right. budget referendum, for right. the, uh, uh, the primary, and then the gubernatorial. So you'd have to multiply it. Right. So I imagine a larger mail company would do it just for, would do it for under, um, you know, probably for our size town. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're just under ten thousand dollars for each event. Okay. And can you play the, the um, referendum on February fifteenth on par as far as what it would cost with the other election? What was that? I'm sorry. The the, the referendum that we're having on February fifteenth, just the sheer numbers of what you'd have to deal with. Are you obviously that's going to be a much smaller number than you'll have to deal with with any of the other. Right. So right now, right now, if we were if if the elector was mailing in um, and giving us their application, I'm going to assume it's going to be something more similar to uh, the municipal election that we just had um, for manpower. Um, we still do extra time in my office, um, but we can certainly um, cover that um, with the you know a regular um, staff. And a, and a little extra help that wouldn't be as big as as the gubernatorial. So what's the next step here? Is I ask my question to my What's the next step here as far as are you gonna are you gonna get a proposal on what we plan to do? What we should do? Uh, well, I think do we feel that we have the time to well first let us not ask these questions. So you mentioned that. thanks. Um, you mentioned yeah, consulting with sort of your your colleagues in the yeah. association. For town clerks, whatever that body is, um, what are you hearing in terms of feedback? What are the best practices? Are there, you know, examples of what others are doing that are working well and not working well, or what should we be doing? So, to be perfectly honest, right now, um, and even from the Secretary of State, they pretty much said, "Why would you do this now? There's no procedure for us." Um, the town clerk um, has, has nothing to go by. There's COVID is not on there. Um, the Secretary of State did it when COVID was on there. And, and again, that's a question with um, that's SEC, with election enforcement, has to make a determination on. We are not in a situation as town clerks to take this on. And actually, if I can find this here with what you know, asking and telling us. With everything that we have to do, um, SEC, SEC basically said, you know, we as town clerks and the whole entire system, we're not in a situation to take on um, how absentee ballots and, and the applications um, are materializing right now. Um, this is a whole new process that nobody has taken on. Um, to be perfectly honest, the other town clerks that I've spoken to that did this um, for the municipal election, there was a lot of complaints from the, from the town people. Um, and even back in the presidential election um, and in our municipal election, um, people are calling my office saying, why did I get this? I did not request it. Um, you know, so we have to field all those questions. In addition to taking the time to to to, to process everything, so you know certainly again calling this question over the thirty day period um, that allows us to be able to now is huge compared to what we've done in the previous referendum where we were only able to the person to designate someone to then figure out how to get that person the ballot and it was a much shorter period of time. So this is, I think, an extremely positive why start. Was, why was it done that way in the past? There's two options. I don't know. The it's state, yeah. the and and the state allows, what they allow, there's two, app, there's two separate applications, depending on what you're doing. Yeah. And most referendums, a lot of towns call it under the 30 days. And truthfully, what happens during budget referendum 
when if, if it doesn't pass the first time, by the time we're going to call a second one, you're really in a real time restraint, you're under the 30 days. Um, but that's the requirement of the state. So, right. So, you know, our approach right now to call it over the 30 days, I think, um, is a huge benefit for the elector that we can mail them. I also, um, you know, hope to be able to put out uh, more articles in the source. Uh, we'll work with uh, the reporter and get out more details to people. That goes into every household. We can certainly do uh, the Everbridge call. Uh, we know we use the social media, which in the past, um, our webmaster has helped and, and assisted with that. Um, so, you know, I think that we can reach out in a lot of different ways. <laughs> Thanks for all this, Nancy. And I think the new piece of information for me tonight was the having to match up the, uh, the names to the person who's actually filled in the serial number. Um, application of uh, that certainly wrinkle. Uh, so a couple of questions. If a thousand people spontaneously went on the web and downloaded and mailed in today, mm -hmm. would you be prepared to process those? Um, at the moment, I'm not, but you know, as I see them coming in, I can certainly adjust and we'd have to find more help. You know, we'll and we'll do what we can. Um, as quickly as we can, as I see them coming in. So and again, we, we encourage people to do things sooner rather than later. Right. So we I, can address I, it. So I, I think for budgeting purposes moving forward, we've gone through two big election cycles now where we have uh, trained people, in effect, to vote absentee. Um, I don't think we can unwind that, regardless of what the state does with their laws. Um, and as a practical matter, if I fill in that I'm going to be out of town, um, is there a is, is there a is there a mechanism in place to check up to see if I'm really here? So I, I think that uh, people's desire to vote in the convenience of the absentee is going to trump whatever excuses is on the ballot, and we just need to acknowledge that for, for what it is. So um, if you need resources of the board of selectmen um, to process. Um, these things in other way, then, then, then please, you know, bring them forward. Um, I understand the Secretary of State says why. Um, for me, the answer is really very easy. Um, it's an extraordinary referendum um, because it's out of cycle. So it's not a normally um, scheduled referendum like we have in May, like we have in November. And it's for an extraordinary amount of money. Um, and it's happening in the middle of winter at a time when people are away, either because they're at a winter home or because they're away on a family vacation. One thing I know for sure, 49% of the voting and non-voting public are going to be unhappy with the outcome. And if we don't do everything we can do to put our best foot forward to get as much participation in this as possible, I think that we will be subjected to um, even more second guessing on the process. So for me, this is about how do we get to yes? What has to be true for us to get as much voter engagement as possible? And for instance, on the application, short of filling in a person's name, if we have the printer put on the header, this ballot is intended for Mary Jones, um, and if you're not Mary Jones, please don't fill this ballot in uh, and then let the person do it. Um, uh, another option would be a more simple postcard, which I think is one of the options yes. you've got. And that would simply be, hey, everyone, we are expecting a referendum in February. Um, if you aren't going to be around for the referendum, here's the link that you can go to and print out the application and mail it back to us so that you can be sure to have a vote. Um, again, this is about putting our best foot forward as a town. Um, we always, well, we as, as municipal officials like to complain that we don't get enough voter engagement. Um, and regardless of the outcome um, that you support as an individual, uh, any vote with a high turnout is a good day for democracy. It's a good day for all of us, even if you're not on the winning side. So um, I, I think from my perspective, 
I would like to see us work towards a plan that gets more engagement and um, to help Nancy with whatever resources she needs to, to make that happen. With the clock ticking on all of this, what is your drop dead um, for, for action from the Board of Selectmen? Um, uh, do, you know, do you know what that is? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Kind of, as it considers it's a rock, <laughs> too, the absentee ballot right. uh, or the uh, right. So, um, and, and a number of things here. So, first of all, you have to remember when someone ha um, completes an application for an absentee ballot, they are swearing to the truth of the information when they sign it, um, which we have to keep maintained for a certain period of time by state statute um, before it can be uh, you go for retention time. Um, and not be destroyed. So the person is swearing to the truth that they are out of town or, or um, unable to go because of you know illness or whatever. Um, that's that's number one. Uh, the second thing is, I just want to say, in, in the past, especially during the presidential, um, everyone at actually town hall, my staff was incredible um, and really stepped up and, and did everything they had to do in extra time and, and hours. Um, the town allowed us to take over the conference room that we needed, um, extra computers, the IT department. Uh, I, I can't tell you, everybody put in time and helped, and, and everybody was incredible, and the support was just fabulous from, from the other employees helping us putting together packets so that we'd have them ready. Um, so that's other departments helping us as well when they could. So the support from everybody has just been tremendous. So if we find that we're in a situation, um, I will reach out and speak up, and, and I have no doubt that we'll get the support that we need. Um, so and I, and I appreciate that. Um, I do feel like the postcard is probably a great way to go right now. And just, you know, SEC reminded me, you know, as long as it's neutral, there's no reason why you can't put a link on there of where to go for the application. Um, tell them the locations of the polling place, um, you know, in the day and that this is a proposed um, um, event because uh, the, the postcard can go out ahead of time, um, you know, if we're saying that it's proposed um, because they had said you can't do anything with sending out the applications until we actually call the question. But a generic postcard, I don't see why, you know, why, why that would be an issue. Um, the only other thing with that is uh, we've already had one local printer tell us that they can't accommodate us. Um, you've got shutdowns during the holiday season, uh, you know, between um, Christmas and New Year's. Um, it's a short time period between now and uh, when the question's called on, on January 12th or 11th. Actually, it's the 11th. Um, if we were to do applications, they wouldn't be able to have them done and go out um, until um, later that day after it's called. Um, there's going to be less of an issue if we do a postcard, uh, less questions. And I would say, um, you know, again, it just has to be really generic because you're using town funds. That's another issue that comes up um, with, um, with elections enforcement. So um, in that in the packet, we have a kind of estimated price. So obviously, if you yeah. wanted to go in that direction, you have to commit that you have to provide funding to your department. Right. That's around $8,800, yeah. right? And, and that would not go out to taxpayers. That would just go yeah. out to uh, electors. Right? That was based on um, 13,900 right. active electors. Okay. So okay, so let's let's clarify that because that's going to confuse yeah, right. people. There right. are there are electors and there are voters. Uh, well, well, that's, 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 yeah. And there's taxpayers. Taxpayer voters. So the charter distinguishes yeah. electors yeah. And, and voters. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, electors elect people. Voters vote for money. So that's the target. Audience. So the taxpayers. There are, I think it was 26,000, um, and that that would encompass um, property, um, automobile, and personal property. Anything over a thousand dollars, so, right? Right. Any, any tax bill, that would individual. individual. Yeah. Right. Right. So those are the those are the people that are eligible to vote. 
in February. So you as, have, you with, have with restrictions. There's some other restrictions as well. Um, with the registrar's office, they can tell you, you know, you, they still have to be a U.S. citizen. They have to be over the age of 18. To vote in budget referendums? To vote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, and I might add too, you know, the state is not so much involved with what the town is doing, but they still regulate what the town clerk can do. Are they regulating who can set up those No, no. No, I think it's more, you know, obviously the $8,000 budget is not capturing. It, it wouldn't send out, it would also be, you'd have to take time to identify, because you mentioned trust, for example, right? Oh, you'd, have find, you'd have to find the trustee. So there would be a lot of time spent about getting it to the, well, I guess you're just sending the postcard to any taxpayer. Does it matter? I mean, can you just- Well, because you could be, you could be yeah, sending it to a taxpayer that's, that's not eligible, eligible to vote. Yeah. It's more information. Yeah, so sure. for a postcard, it's different than sending an applicant. Yes. 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 Also, we can go link to go where to go to get an application. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, we right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but you could be sending it to potential uh, taxpayers that are not eligible. So I think that as the in, in the world of, of good enough um, and close enough, the it, it, if we inadvertently send it to a non-US resident who owns property in Madison and they're not eligible to vote, that'll show up once they try to fill in the application. Right. Or they'll already realize that. I, I mean, are, are we even talking about dozens of people um, out of eligible voters? So. I think I think so our target you audience. Have to, you have to cross reference electors, so you would have to cross reference your list, right? Taxpayer versus elector. I, I would just go straight. If you get a tax bill from the town, you tax go to the Then you would just go to the tax. You just go to the tax. Yeah, not once again, it's not an absentee ballot application. So you have to talk about the postcard. Yeah, the postcard. It's a, and, and the postcard is really the only workable solution. I mean, get, so you double the eight thousand basically. You'd be at like sixty thousand yeah. dollars for that. Well, I, I, I would hate yeah. for somebody to come back and say, you're voting on $100 million and you wouldn't spend $16,000 million or $16,000 to get it. Oh, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just mm -hmm. saying that that would be the number, though. Yeah. Like, it would be higher than the estimate. And, and it did come up, you know, for that kind of a thing because you're using yeah. town funds to get legal or legal advice yeah. on the wording uh, on the postcard to ensure that we were keeping it neutral. Well, because also you're going to be sending this out before the board has actually even voted uh, on the question. And so I would also want to get the councils on that because the quiet period comes in when we do that final call to question on January uh, 11th. So we haven't had those conversations yet. I think we should have to. Yeah, we just got to make sure that, okay, we would need to probably do this before that. It would have to be done like the first of the year. Well, we wouldn't be endorsing an outcome. We would simply be alerting to a, a, a referendum. Yeah. So, yeah. Referendum, yeah. so I don't it's think it would be violating a quiet yeah. period. We have to put notices yeah. in the paper. That doesn't violate Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just think we would need to, to confirm all that, though, just to make sure, you know, what, what it's actually, they would have to sign off on the postcard. That's what I'm saying, to make sure that we're not creating any kind of. Uh, well, given, given the, the, the late hour of the um, um, process, if you like the evening, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm prepared to endorse us spending um, what we need for the postcard, um, and uh, we can we can we can bless it after the fact if that's what needs to happen at the next special meeting. If it's under ten thousand dollars, obviously it's within your prerogative to, mm -hmm. to just do. But it'll be over. Um, but but uh, I. I, I um, well, let's hear other board thoughts. And um, I mean, because I think, like, in terms of an action item, it would be the money, right, that we'd be approving and not. I like, think, yeah. yeah. And because it's just it, a postcard and it's not requiring you to do something out of your scope of. Well, the, the postcard can come from anyone. Yeah. You know, that, you know, I, I would have to be overseeing applications. Um, so we would actually have to have the tax. Yeah. yeah. You just, it, well, okay. So, um, yeah, but I'm saying it would basically whose department would it come from? It would come from your department. It would, be, it would just be uh, alerting people that there's an election. Uh, it could come saying, from just it could come from the, the town. town. That's, okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's just the post. It could come from the five of us. With our picture. <laughs> 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 
Then no one will read it at all. They'll just put it in the trash. So you need to take any action tonight at all. Well, we don't really talk about this year. No, I think. Oh, I think that you know you have to remember. You know, every there are people that are you know the. The printers are closed um, and short-handed. They're also short-staffed. The sooner they know, the better. I think that there was one that said that they needed it by tomorrow if um, if we were going to do anything. Um, we kind of eliminated them. Um, so the, the timing, though, for a postcard, what's the date that the printer that was capable of doing, they would say they get it by what, the end of the year? Um, I think that if we can get it to them, you got to get it to them, like, it's just as soon as possible. And it depends because if you do you want to start if you can getting it out prior to right. the eleventh or as soon as it hits the eleventh. Yeah. And you have to remember too the uh, mailing period. Um, yeah. Well now, yeah, it's, well, it, it, because of all the volume. So the volume. I think yeah. using their bulk rate um, first class, um, it could take I can't remember which is four days, five days, or up to eight. I think it could take up to eight, they said. You know, if we wanted to act on this tonight, we'd have to open the agenda. Okay. That's um, not an action. But I think that, I mean, what we could do is we have a couple of questions we could ask the town council about this and get clarity. And if you could get a firm timeline from one of the printers, we could do a quick Wednesday vote, right? Um, and all we're really doing is we're giving you authority, I guess, to do this, or is it the, because the money can come later, right? So, so to, to my way of thinking, Peggy, you could, yeah. you could, you could set that direction yeah. as the chief executive. Um, we just have the procedural issue of approving money right. um, for it since it's unbudgeted. Um, you do have some contingency money that you may be able to to just sort of dip into, but it's the 10,000, isn't it, that is the trigger. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't know. So I'll, I will I will say in advance I will support it. Um, uh, so I wouldn't want that to. to I feel like we need a little more concrete details. I feel like we. I'd love to see the yeah, card. I'd love to know the exact yeah, facts. Well, I'd love to know the. Well, and have the draft of what would be. Yeah. So I think this is where. Let's see what we can accomplish the next couple of days and get a realistic time frame and a real price, knowing that we're having to go out to taxpayers. Um, and then, um, you know, that, you know, we can get that in the next couple of days and then we just see where we are. And then I will check with the board if we have to do a quick Zoom, you know, approval. And then you'll see what the part of the postcard says. Because I don't want somebody to go, that's not what I intended on the postcard. You know, if we want to make sure we're all happy with this, this is a new, and I think then we have to also have that conversation about, okay, are we going to start doing this for the budget referendum or other all referendums? It does sort of set precedent. Yes. So, so I precedent. disagree with that. I don't think it sets precedent, uh, precedence, right? You can you can set your plot by the May referendum and the fall elections. Um, it's these extraordinary voting well, events. So You're talking about the off-cycle. Yeah, but then here's another off -cycle. I'm just saying, so are we setting a precedent, precedent for off-cycle? So, charter. I, I'll so stipulate we, we, that we, every we time we try to spend $100 million, we, uh, <laughs> we go ahead and... <laughs> okay, when, what about charter? Or okay, what if we end up having standalone for charter? We're going to be for charter. That might be this year, too. We have a ton. We, we may put that up. But, uh, I think you talked about the budget referendum. We don't know. So we want to... I'm just saying, we're hoping... You are setting a precedence, and now that's going to be a debate for every referendum that the town has. Well, we did it for this one. Why aren't we doing it for this one? So that's why I think I'm not saying we shouldn't do it, but I think we need to think about it a little bit, get more detail, and then we'll convene again as a board. And, we, and I think we can pull something together over the next couple of days. I know it's, it's not for the postcard. Yeah, for the postcard. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Right, right. Yeah, and this is. You know different circumstances too where we are so um so okay is that good then and then to come back and reach out to the board and get more facts so i'll just observe our site a couple of frantic hands in the air this is a better yeah. process you'll have an opportunity to comment at the end of the meeting um it, this is really a discussion amongst us Okay, all right. Thank you, Nancy. Obviously, a lot of hard work, and I know our registrars were involved in all this. Um, and so, uh, uh, thank you for that. And then we'll follow up soon on that. Um, next item on the agenda is discuss a recommendation for the ad hoc ARP funding advisory committee objectives. Um, and so, this I do have I'd sent out some graphs, slides, slides, and I'm going to share. 
I got them ahead of time for so this. Change on one, but not a big change. Actually, not on this. Um, so this is a discussion only today. Um, to just uh, we're going to be appointing late, later the final members of the com committees of the American Rescue Plan funds. And so for the public's benefit, um, when we received the funds in June. Uh, the town received $5.3 million. Um, we had a long-term recovery committee that the, um, the town had been working on. Bruce sat on that committee along with myself and then town staff. And we came up with a list of possible uses of, of uh, the American Rescue Plan funds that the town had received. Um, and so over the summer, part of this was to get the money moving. And so um, the long-term recovery committee uh, uh, prioritized some projects. Um, those projects were then recommended to the Board of Selectmen. Um, the Board of Selectmen then voted on those projects, and then it was sent to the Board of Finance, and then the Board of Finance voted on those projects, and then those projects were then considered approved projects. Um, but I think over time, one of the things that we wanted to encourage was more public oversight and involvement. And so we um, charged a committee in September um, and to kind of oversee uh, the remaining funds. Um, and that committee will be um, seated starting in January. Um, and so I'll just summarize kind of, um, and what we wanted to do as a board was talk about guidance for that committee. Um, and so uh, what kind of guidance should we give them some thoughts and also what the process, approval process, because I realized we really hadn't talked about this now that we had the committee in place, what's the approval process? So I think we get a good discussion now and then formalize this in January. So when the committee is seating, they kind of have a roadmap of how they should be approaching this. Um, so this is just a status of what the town has done. Um, and I apologize, there's probably a bunch of typos in here. I'm just really <laughs> so, um, but it talks about round one was done, I think, in June, and round two was July, and round three was in uh, August. And these are various projects and um, that we identified that we thought were worthy of supporting and using the funds. Um, so, the, so far, we've... Um, uh, I don't want to use the term spent because these haven't necessarily all been spent, but we've approved or earmarked $800,000 up to $5.3 million. And then one of the things the board had talked a lot about was trying to prioritize some of our uh, capital projects and try to get those done through American Rescue Plan funds. And so um, uh, as part of the CIP process, I spent a lot of time with town staff and we went through and pulled out, or at least flagged, a bunch of projects that we thought could qualify uh, under American Rescue Plan funds. So there's a lot of like specifics of American Rescue Plans of what you can spend it on and what you can't. The guidance has been evolving, so what we had thought maybe in June might be a little different now, and so the committee is going to have to get its arms around that. Um, and so um, you'll see in October, um, I submitted a, a list of recommended projects as part of the CIP plan. Um, and that's on this page, um, and that's something that the board reviewed also. We had a quick meeting in, I think it was late September before I submitted the final letter, the board selectmen reviewed those projects. Um, and so of the, that list, that's two and a half million dollars basically, or half of it, um, that we'd be pulling out of our capital plan. And that would still leave almost two million dollars for the committee to work through and make determinations about what we want to do for the community with this. Um, and so uh, so basically, if you assume that we're going to go with the two and a half million for CIP, which that hasn't been determined yet, that's just a recommendation, CIP is going to be talking about it, they're going to look at it, and that's why we're talking about process a little bit, you know, because I'm not sure what that process is going to be still about who picks what projects get pulled out of the CIP. Um, and then the rest of the funding would go to the uh, to the new committee uh, for um, selecting projects. Uh, and so this is the CIP list. A lot of it was targeted at the time about our outdoor amenities because those were hit hard by COVID and used a lot by the community. Um, and this is also just uh, uh, and it so focuses on like bathroom repairs, um, uh, beach and rec facilities. And then also one of the things that a lot of towns are doing is looking at improved um, air quality systems in their buildings. So we have a, a, a large project that has been in CIP for quite a while um, 
uh, for redoing the HVAC system in the town hall. And that was when we thought that this would be a good one to just knock off and get done. It's been sitting there and postponed for years and it's desperately needed. And then as the board has talked about, we're trying to move towards fossil, you know, using, using less fossil fuels. And so we earmarked this as a geothermal system. So that was one that was put on this list. Um, and then um, uh, there's some other ventilation projects and things like that. So, and this will all be talked about at, um, and the, the CIP meetings too about this list. Um, so, you want to go back to that? Yeah. On this. Um, so, Pardon you're me. right. So, the, the exact projects are to be discussed, but right. let's assume for a moment that some of them, if not right. most of them, make it through the cut um, right. with, with, the, with our board support. Right. Um, I, I would suggest that we start to pull these projects in as quickly as they're ready to be pulled in mm -hmm. um, and, and, and just get them out of the way instead of leaving them in the out years. Oh, no, um, that one, this is just, I just literally pulled them. I, I, I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, I agree with that. And, um, and also note, note that some of them are of our studies and you know additional work and stuff. But yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. And yeah. I would also recommend that the CIP continue to fund the reserve accounts as if the town were going to have to um, pay for these, making those fund, make, so making the, the, the reserve funding steady and creating that money for future other projects. Right. Other recommendations for CIP is right. to consider it, not to cut back their funding level, no, no. Right. Uh, and then for us to pull these in as much as it is practical to do so. Right, and and I think that would be a conversation our board would have too. Would we get the CIP recommendation back? So this is where I was saying I was struggling. I was trying to write out what is our process because we've got an overlap with CIP, and for the public's benefit, um, the members of this ARPA committee are going to include our CIP representatives, Maureen, right, and um, Al, <laughs> um, and then you're also on the ARPA committee. Correct. So, um, so there'll be kind of good continuity with that, um, you know. And then um, I think we'll have to have some discussion about that. And absolutely to your point, um, the idea here is to save for future taxpayers, right? You're save for future taxes. Try to get pull as much off the table now, put it aside, so that we can get other things done and um, um, and help us in the future. Uh, so, um, so that still though leaves. You know, two, even if we did all of those, that was two million dollars. There's still a list from our long-term recovery committee that some are hanging on that waiting requests. All those would go to the committee to decide. Um, and then um, I was just thinking, to, you know, try to give some overall guidance. I did this based on our conversation on long-term recovery. This is kind of where we came out with other projects that we funded. Um, so that at least there was kind of a, 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 a mission statement, you know, that they could work off of. Um, and then, um, you know, so we have a mission statement for the committee and we talk about the process and then we can give them all the information um, that we had from long-term recovery with remaining projects. Uh, and so these seem to fit well from everything that I've seen other communities doing um, with their ARPA funds, as well as what our, some of our, what our needs are um, and that they align with the treasury, uh, treasury guidance too. Um, and so that was what this the intention was. This was just to give some guidelines for the committee. And like I said, tonight is a discussion, you know, and then we can kind of enforce this at our first meeting in January. So it probably does um, bear some more filling out as you're suggesting that we define the process a little bit better because this is new ground for us. Uh, it's technically a special appropriation process, but it's really not because we're not going to say taxpayer money, uh, it's more like grant money. Uh, right. Right. So uh, I think that we have room to make sure that everybody's involved and engaged in the decision, but um, this doesn't necessarily have to wait for the budget referendum to go forward no. for us to pull the trigger. Right, no, no, I think this is, I think the process that we've laid out already was we were getting really positive feedback that this is what people want. It's been a public process, it's followed our normal processes, and both boards have voted on it. I think having the additional committee layered over this, especially as we go out for things outside of town government, before most of them were town government, right? But now as we go out to other things outside of town government, I think we want to make sure that the public is represented and there's a separate focus on it. Um, 
So I think like you can look at this and we can send comments back or whatever if we want to refine it, but this was kind of a guideline. And then this, like I said, I was struggling with, what is our process here? Because it's new and because it kind of interacts with CIP, I was kind of trying to figure out, you know, somehow we have to meet with CIP to talk about the list of projects um, and, you know, get their feedback. And you guys are on that committee. So it's deciding we like the list that was presented and we want to add some stuff. I know Bruce, you and I have talked about instead doing one big giant project, right? We're talking about the emergency shelter. And, you know, I felt it was important to leave enough money for other things, but that's part of what you can talk about in CIP. Because that was a really big um, project. Yeah, the good news um, is, is that that all of the money this frees up yeah. creates money for something else. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so it, it's your pots of money. Right. Right. I think right. our, our first and our biggest criteria is making sure the money is spent in accordance with guidelines. Right. So that should the, the state ever make good on their threat to audit us and every other town, right. um, that, that we're in good standing. So I have every faith that we will that we will be, but right. And I, and I also think the um, one of the things we've hired is this consultant to review our entire portfolio of CIP projects to earmark other grants that we're going to go after. Bill Bill has been working with me on this, and so like for example, the emergency shelter, there might be some FEMA grants that we could go after. So if we think we have a high probability on some of these other projects too, we're you know let's go. I'm a, I'm a, let's go after as much money as possible. Um, you know, and so we're trying to come up with a strategy with that. And that could be part of the discussion with CIP too. Like, okay, this is ARPA, this is FEMA, this is state, you know, and we try to target different things uh, with that. So. I would just like to add, um, I thank you for all the work you've done before I got here on this. Um, you know, for interviewing people that want, we wanted to, you know, that might be on the committee, Al and I really purchased some great citizens. And one of the things that kept coming up is, don't look at this just as projects. Look at this as a transformational opportunity for your town. What will 20 years from now you'll look back and because of some project here, something we decided to do here made a difference for the citizens of the town. So sometimes you have to look a little broader, a little bigger, um, to, to, to see what I can see what you can do. It's not just when I first heard about the money, I was thinking of a whole bunch of projects that we wanted to finish up. But uh, we've got to think long term too. If there's an opportunity here to do something that normally we would never do. No, I think that's a fair point, and it's thinking of those other things that never make it on the list, right? That could really make a difference. And they make it. Um, one of the other things, and I put this in the slides for the board. We talked about this in the fall. Was creating some sort of um, grant programs for community or economic development or the arts community. And um, there's been some models now. Other towns have done some of this where they've created a pool of money, they've created a grant programs. So we have some models to look after, uh, look at, and maybe mimic, and then decide. The committee can decide do they want to put, you know, $100,000 on that with $5,000 grants, or do they want to do, you know, a lot more or less? Or, um, so I think this would be a great way to at least touch everybody. Um, and set these funds up, and you can merge it all to one fund and just have it be community support, or you know, so that the committee could talk about all that, decide how they would want to do it. Um, the one thing I will mention is the more broad we make this, the more we go outside of town government, there's going to be, to Bruce's point, an audit issue because they're very strict about you have to have documentation showing how the money is being spent. Very, so you're going to have to have a paper trail for everything. Um, we're learning there's some portals and things like that that we can learn about, but once you go to outside organizations, you're kind of allowing, you're, you're kind of losing control a little bit of that. So, um, so we'll have to think about that. And I thought maybe having the committee like talk to different consultants, you know, and talk about different portals that we could, or programs or things like that that we might want to support. Because um, this is going to be multi-year project. We have to identify how we want to spend by the 2024, and then we have to actually, I, I think, expend all funds by 2026. So there's time to do really think about some of this stuff, too. Yeah, Peggy, but it does not all have to be these funds. We're also, we've talked about um, how large our fund balance is, and we should take a bit. So there's a, a bigger pot of money here that we'll be talking about, I would assume. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's going to be about prioritize like what fits best in which of these boxes in terms of how we fund them. So 
So that's a good problem to have um, <laughs> for now, exactly. Um, but, um, you know, so with that, I thought if you guys want to spend time looking at this and sending comments, and then we would uh, convene again in January and try to finalize it for the new committee. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Peggy, I have yeah. one question. Oh, yes. The economic stabilization for business, is that an individual business? It is. And um, I think a lot of towns, there's different ways to do this, right? Um, and some towns have just said, come in and tell us what you need. And the cap is $5,000. We put in an application and then they vote on whether or not they think it's an appropriate use of funds. What we could do is, my thought was if we're going to do an economic development fund was focus more on where everybody benefits. So we talked about the facades improvement program or something that helps the downtown, that helps the business, everybody gets to experience it. So it's not something in the back room for the, you know, business, um, but it's something that's visible and everybody in the community can benefit from. So that was an idea I had, but we can, those are all things that the um, committee can talk about. Um, and, and I think the other thing is we're moving beyond the crisis mode now because there are a lot of, like we learned about the um, you know, theater received a shutter that venue and hopefully they're going to be opening. Um, but who knows with the new COVID period what's going to happen. So we might need to think about this a little differently in a couple of months. If we have another crisis, you know, we're, we're having to uh, close, close lockdown for a period of time, which I hope we aren't going to be in that position. But at least this is something that we could maybe look into again for helping our, our uh, local businesses. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, with that, then I think uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, discuss and take action to approve a request from the Beach and Recreation and Senior Services Department to release funds from the equipment reserve amount in the amount of $9,846.72. So moved. Okay, great. So this is relating to the purchase of a snowblower, not a snowblower, a, blower, a leaf blower, but they would use it for snow, <laughs> actually. Um, and yeah. And uh, I know they were very eager to jump on this. Um, is Austin here or no? He's not. Okay. okay. He sent us a bunch of information. Yeah, he did. And I think um, I think it's a great thing. This is going to help with the walkway. We had some complaints about the Texas walkway because the, the machine we had to clean was damaging it. This is actually going to help with that. It's going to help them do leaf removal. What normally takes them, what they say, three days or something with three guys, it's going to take them. Um, half that time with one guy, so they'll be able to send their resources out to other locations too. There's really just a lot of benefits to it. So I think it's a, it was a great um, idea. He wanted to get this in place before the season. Yep. So, um, any more discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, motion passes. Okay, um, item number nine discuss the establishment of a town facilities committee. Um, and uh, this is basically um, something we've been talking about quite a bit because I know as we've had to deal with facilities, we've had these ad hocs. So we had it for Island Avenue, we had it for Academy, and then we did um, kind of a working group that um, Scott sat on. I know Aaron had sat on, we had Board of Finance after we received the facilities committee uh, report. Um, and so, you know, ideally we want to put this in place as more of an ongoing thing um, to address strategic issues with our town facility. So we just have an ongoing committee. Um, and so I put this out here for conversation. I think uh, Bill McMinn and I had a talk today because I said, well, we're just going to do this and it'll handle these. And then he starts saying, well, what about this? And how, is this for maintenance? Is it, you know, is this, you know, how does this handle with CIP? You know, is Beach and Rec involved? Because they're the ones that have responsibility for a lot of facilities. So, you know, it kind of made me think, and I'm like, well, we gotta think about this, okay. <laughs> so, um, so this was just a, a proposal to start off with um, about what the committee would look like. I modeled a little bit after Guilford's. Guilford's is actually, they have it as a working group. Um, and I don't think it's a formal ad hoc committee of the Board of Selectmen, um, but, uh, you know, this is trying, I envision this more not day-to-day -day operational type facility stuff, it was more strategic stuff, especially if these referendums happen, you know, we're going to have excess property um, because of the school renewal plan, and then we'll also have youth and family services building to deal with, and rather than 
having mini committees for all these things. I think having a good visionary committee to, to look at the whole portfolio, because we now have a lot of information on all our assets because of the uh, study that was done by um, DRA. Um, and then this allows us to go forward. And then in talking to Bill a little bit, you know, you want to have people who are really, you know, sharp building people that know a lot about buildings and engineers and things like that. But you also need that strategic piece on there too. So would we want to have board selectmen on it? Um, or do we want to give a list of, we, we talked about today, you know, maybe there's just a list. Here's what your first charge is. Focus on these three things, you know? Um, and so not having them responsible for everything, but make it a very defined mission in the beginning. And then we kind of see how it goes. Um, so this is also for conversation that we can talk about now um, and then, you know, finalize this in January so that we're prepared because and if things don't pass in February, we still have to make a lot of decisions. Right. So um, at least we kind of teach this up. So I, so I, I sat on the committee, um, you know, with Aaron and, and obviously spent a lot of time. With that. Yeah. I just added the considerations on the bottom. So I, I spent time with Aaron and, and Bill and, and others on the, on the committee. And I think there was a, a lot of value. We were starting to drive towards you know, strategic planning and, and integration of all the buildings, talking about usage of our buildings. Um, but I, I do think, you know, as I look at the membership, just I guess one specific comment, you know, maybe including our town planner as well um, and integrating maybe a little bit more there as well um, might be a useful exercise, um, especially when we start thinking about usage and economic development and multi-purpose and hybrid use and things like that. So uh, more to consider, but um, I, I think I'm spot on. I think this is really going to be helpful. So. I would just, just add to that all the work think of all the town buildings the public works would de be definitely um, part of that besides the facilities director is public works director town engineer same person same yeah. person still the way he used to be yeah. still anyway i wouldn't i would include him i just would like a little more explanation peggy on the second to the last 100 charges consider the ancillary town properties you just go into that a little bit um, well i think the the reality is that for major capital needs, we're covering a lot of those things. And so I think it's important that we include, you know, especially with obviously it's grant the library, Madison Hose has a facility um, request uh, for, you know, uh, exchanges to the firehouse, you know, you're gonna have the ambulance facilities aging and eventually we're doing this HVAC already through uh, the, at, um, through the ARPA funds. So um, I think we have to figure, have a more proactive dialogue with them so we can, uh, we do it through CIP, which is good, and it goes through CIP, but just those strategic things, you know, um, about where these facilities are and where we're investing. Because um, we may outgrow some of these at one point, and then the town might have other property they'd be appropriate for, or, you know, those types of things. <coughs> Okay, okay. So I'm, I'm thinking about this very incrementally um, in, a, in, in the framework of, of continuous improvement. We need to understand what our current state is. Um, a lot of this work has been done, right? So there is work on the physical state of the buildings, um, and that's good. Uh, but I think we need to join all of this data. So it's the, the inventory of the buildings and the space with some regularity to that information, right? Not just 30,000 square feet, it needs to be broken out by what space really is. Um, who's using it? How is it being used? Um, what is the overall capacity of the uh, facility and its utilization? And then if there's any cyclical nature to it, what are those surge um, numbers look like? Um, are, are we over capacity for two hours a day and then at 10% capacity for the rest of the week, you know, right? But these are, I think, questions that, we're, that we, we want to answer in the early days of, 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 of a group like this. I, I think that would be their first deliverable, coming back to us with a comprehensive picture of what do we have, how is it being used, who's using it, and then we can start to map out a, a way. And, and, and it should be not just the, the municipal buildings, but also the school facilities. Um, and, you know, the, with the help of the district, we can get a sense of what their capacity for community use is um, out of those buildings. 
buildings, but it all figures in. And then um, as part of that data gathering, I know it's been talked about for a while, a, uh, a unified program that tracks the use of different rooms around, um, around town. Now I had a brief conversation with um, Sunny at the library and they use a, a reservation system that is used by towns. It does integrate with towns. And in theory, I'm climbing out on a little bit of a limb here, but in theory, um, we could buy into their system, essentially add on to it, and their space and all of our space would all show up in this big reservation system. And, and ideally, since we're talking about facilities with a capital F here, um, our utilization information has got to be representative of that of that same thing. So we struggled, we struggled with that big time in that committee. I mean, we had you know, limited usage information that came back to us. It was just conference room. And that's why I bring it up. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I bring it up. So I, I would I would think very, very small in the early days of this committee, not worry about the the big hairy picture. Um, that is sure to come. Let's get a better understanding of where we are today and then let that information guide us moving forward with um, instructions to the, the committee and then also it would inform our own decisions. I don't know whether Bruce and I should be talking about big hairy things at all, but uh, <laughs> I think this is a very thoughtful, far reaching strategic idea. I like, I like the notion of it. I think for too long, our buildings um, have not had a strong advocacy uh, for them. And I think uh, many of our buildings in town reflect that. So I see this as a wonderful advocacy for the buildings, a watchdog to uh, keep us alerted to, to things that our buildings need. And I, I know we've looked at Billy for a long time to do that, but I think this would amplify it, and I'm, I'm very pleased with it. Uh, Peggy, I had one question about the word ad hoc. Um, do you see this as permanent or temporary? Well, I, I would envision it, and I think before we, you know, commit to what the charge and the, you know, let's see how it goes and see what the right, you know, mission is and composition is and. Um, get it going, experiment, kind of like we did with the Bicycle Pedestrian Committee, where we'll then you come back and say, yeah, this is working, this is the right way to do this, um, and then we can make it a permanent committee if we want it. Um, so I think that I'm, I, I do know there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, public expectations that we make some decisions on other empty buildings. So the next two years, if, if the renewal plan passes, so we want to, and there's been a lot of discussion about ideas internally, and I think people have ideas, but um, I think it's important that we tackle. So to your point, like, I think we can focus on some of those small action items, but I do think we got to make the primary focus about, okay, we've got these other assets and we got to start showing progress. So we're not, you know, um, uh, deferring decisions for a while, because we'll have, you know, the Ryerson property, the Jeff, uh, Jeffrey School location, this is if the school plan passes. And then depending on what happens with Academy, we may still have Academy. <laughs> so uh, that'll be another conversation. And then if we don't get Academy successful, then one of these family services buildings to think about too. So, but we'll have time because it'll take a couple of years while the projects get done and the construction before. So it gives us an opportunity to think about it. Um, so, but I, I agree that, um, you know, the, the, but you know, making it permanent, I think once we have a better handle on what we really want to get out of it and if it's successful for it. So, um, I, just want, I just wanted to add, uh, just bringing up the usage study, it's so important, but with COVID, it's so difficult, more difficult than ever. Um, I'm in the senior center twice a week, it's empty. And that wasn't the way before COVID. So I don't know how you would do a use. I know when Austin talks, he talks about, you know, meeting space at night. But during the day, that building is pretty empty since COVID. And I would say the library most likely has the same thing happening. So and I hear that from people when we talk about the February 15th date, we talk about Academy. They're like, yeah, but we got this empty building, this empty building. 
they really got to be reminded we're in the middle of a pandemic still and people have not come back to these buildings at all, especially the seniors now. Yeah. But we need to know. And I think that the plan is, um, you know, because we actually have uh, the senior center has its own booking uh, software, which I found out recently that's separate too. So one of the things I'm trying to do is bring a lot of this under one umbrella, and that's going to involve um, a lot of discussion between the different uh, departments as well as with IT to see what makes sense. But it should all come eventually under one umbrella. Um, and then if you have academy in the mix, that's where we're a bigger conversation too, right? Because that's a lot of meeting. Work. But I think we're all, I know I'm committed to try to get this all online and track better. So, um, okay. So with that, I guess we'll get on that and we'll come back and discuss that again uh, next month. Okay. Um, item number 10, discuss and take action to approve the following appointments to ad hoc committees. Uh, the ad hoc marijuana advisory, so I'll just do this as a whole thing here. Uh, ad hoc marijuana advisory committee, uh, Bruce Wilson from the Board of Selectmen, Marianne Connolly from the Board of Ed, uh, Bob Zeller from the East Family Services Board, and Ron River, Board of Police Commission, Dave Courtney, John Dobson, and Aaron Gerard as public members. Um, the ad hoc ARP funding slash COVID task force advisory committee. I wish I picked a short name for that. I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know what we're thinking there. Um, uh, Justin Murphy and Katie Stein, Board of Finance, Emily Rosenthal, Board of Ed, uh, John Brady, and Bob Reinhardt, public members. And I know our board had already appointed to that committee. Um, and then the 2021 Ad Hoc Charter Review Commission, uh, Mark Casparino. So a motion. So moved. Okay, second. second. Okay. Are we expecting um, to be added to? I don't see a, a P and Z name on uh, on the marijuana. And uh, EDC as well. And then so we're going to do an Italian yeah. chart. Uh, uh, that's a liaison. Yeah, I think yeah, it's more like a liaison. That. So oh, there's yeah. a liaison. We don't need to be. Yeah. Sure. Like there are a liaison for marijuana. I want to say there's a lot of us. Me, Deb, well, HR. <laughs> right. Um, planning, zoning, yeah. ease. So we have a yeah. couple of committees. Or yeah. We have a couple of commissions that we're waiting on there. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, those will be appointed in January. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, um, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, great. Passes. Okay, number uh, 11 on the agenda. Uh, discuss and take action to approve the following appointments, reappointments for terms to end January 1st, 2026. Uh, Bauer Park Advisory Committee, Holly Johnson and Judd, Ted Ryan, Paul, John Colson, Conservation Commission, Christina Bouchard. Heather Crawford, Sophia Eden, Will you retire the board? Paul Kessinger, Joseph Mako, Energy and Efficiency Committee, Ron Hicks, Fireman's Benefit Committee, Paul Kessinger, Bob, Robert Newman, Inland Wettens, Joseph Boudreau, John Matthew, Job Evaluation Committee, Vince Dusick, Peter Thomas, Rob Zeller, uh, Planning and Zoning, Elliot Hitchcock, Police Commission, Tom Cartledge, Ed Dowling, Jude Friedman, Police Retirement Board, Paul Kessinger, Robert Newman, uh, Rockland Preserve Committee, Jason Engelhar, David Okamato, <laughs> Salt Meadow Advisory Committee, uh, Mark Casparino, Warren Hartman, Lynn Pickett, uh, Senior Commission, Christine Abbott, Gerard Karens, Shellfish Commission, Margaret Newcomb, Veterans Commission, Richard Casey, Helen Kaiser Pedersen, uh, Water Pollution Control Authority, Thomas Hansen, Peter Pastore, uh, Youth and Family Services Board, Andrea Aaron, and Jessica Bowler. So moved. May I just pull off signing and zoning? I'd like to vote separately on that. So you are you making a motion to a motion of the agenda? Voting out the general vote. This is sort of like a what you call it, by consensus, and I. It's a sleep of us. Yeah. There is a motion in Robert's rules for that. Right. I forget exactly what it is. Well, if there's anything that everyone doesn't agree on in consensus, 
I mean, usually pull it out and do it separately. Um, okay. Um, well, well, I think I'll we have to second the motion. At least. Well, uh, we we have to leave one of these names as a separate vote. Maybe the way. Well, the motion that's on the table is for the slate. We well, you know that I just read. So, um, uh, so. So, we can, so she's moved to amend the motion. Okay. Very good. I've seconded it. Okay. Uh, and discussion. So the well, I mean, I, I, I share Noreen's concern. This is a bit of an awkward space um, around um, the, our, our volunteers, um, and uh, I, I agree with Noreen that the, the planning and zoning vote is an awkward one. Um, there is no Particular problem with, with Elliot. I think he's a, he's, a, he's a fine member of the commission, so they don't, in, in essence, object to his reappointment. Um, I'm objecting to the absence of the reappointment of, of two other um, serving commissioners. So well, I, I was just thinking, is that better to discuss on item 12, though, which is the. It's already there. That's all. Yes, I just said, nothing more can take. Finding zoning out of the old more consensus splits. It's yeah. it, it's it's it needs majority vote. So uh, to, to 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 break it out. I don't I don't want to vote. I'm I'm comfortable voting consensus with everything I with and I like I'm requesting that one planning zoning get off the consensus. I guess I feel sorry. like we have the the planning and zoning conversation at the number twelve. Right. That's I guess the point because number twelve is the uh, people moving up into the planning and zoning. We'll have so we can have a conversation there. Actually, people that are being reached might issue with reasons. Okay, that's fine. So we can, um, I guess, all in favor of amending the motion as um, requested by Norma. Can you say aye? Aye. Aye. Okay, that's fine. We can pull that out. Um, and then so, have, and then. Order or clarification. Yeah. I don't recall appointing Jude to the commission, and we've got her down as a reappointment. I thought that was just a typo, but I don't think these are all. I think these are all for 2026, right? So I thought it was just appointments or reappointments. Yes, and when Peggy read the motion, she said appointments and reappointments. Yeah. I think it was just left out because the words are all, all the same. The term okay, so the confusion is, is item number 12 is appointments. Well, the, the, these are all alternates moving up. That's what. Okay, so, okay, so, 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 so the agenda okay. is not intending to say that Jude is a sitting Correct. commissioner Correct. being she reappointed. Right. She's appointed, being, yes, she's being appointed to a vacant to a position that. That will okay. reappoint up to January 1st, 2026. Right. Those three people in item 12, aren't we have to vacate their alternate seat. Right. So it's a resignation and a reappointment and an appointment. So that's why they were broken up separate. So okay. that was I'm just fine. Fine. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> um, no, because I saw that and I think it was just a typo that she dropped out. Of me. That's all. Okay. Um, so, okay, so we had, uh, so can um, I got that? I'd like to make a motion to vote on the slate. Um, with the amended with the removal of planning and zoning from the slate, second, first, or whatever. Okay, all right, we're still on item 11. Um, okay, now discussion. Everybody's fine. We've removed, we've removed. We're gonna, yeah, I, I do want to say, yeah, I'm looking at some of these, all of these volunteers yeah. who are so fortunate. I look yeah. at water pollution control authorities, I think yeah. Tom Hansen. Peter Pastore have been on for more than 25 years. Uh -huh. and we have long-term volunteers and new ones, which, which is great. But I look at the list here, and it's pretty amazing. Um, not like I'm doing it here tonight. Um, it's pretty amazing how fortunate um, Madison is with all these dedicated people that want to help our town. Yep. Well, we all know water pollution is the sexiest board yeah. Yeah. that the town has. Oh, I was on it for a while. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> well, unfortunately. I learned too much about septic. Like we're doing. All right, let's vote. Okay, so all in favor of the amendment slate, say aye. 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 Okay, great. Um, and then uh, now we need motion. Uh, well, now we're the same. So um, you want to vote on it separately? So um, I'm going to make a motion to um, approve uh, Elliot's pitch back to the planning and zone. 
I'll second. Reappointed to planning and zoning. Second. So second. Okay. Discussion. I think Elliot is going to Okay. I, I, I would. Okay. I would just say um, I don't know Elliot at all. I'm sure he's going to do his wife works for the town of Madison and she's doing a good job for us too. In fact, she might be in the she might be in zoning office, isn't she? I don't know. I don't know his wife. I thought this was like works in zoning off that well, I could be wrong. But I knew I've heard good things about both of them. Um, but I, I, you know what, I think someone said this is a little embarrassing. I think Bruce said a little embarrassing. I don't find this embarrassing what's happened here. I think it's a low point, a low point for Madison. I've never seen volunteers treated the way Ron Clark and Joe Vanosky. And you can tell me that, well, we need a change on the board. Um, want to bring some new blood in. We didn't do that on the board of it. We brought an old league in with term limits that expired and made sure they handpicked him to be the um, chairman. This is the first time in history that I know a leader of a political party picks our chairman of our, our bipartisan boards. It's, it's never happened in history town. And I was thinking of this story today when I was in selectman the first time, and Al was right before you got on, Tom Scarpati was first selectman, and he was sort of new. And um, Gary Leonard, a Democrat, was chairman of the PNC. And we were in the thick of fighting about the airport. Leland was in. You had the group that didn't want it. You had the Leland people. PNC were meeting for hours and hours and hours. There was a group that came in. And ironically, Bill Stableford and his wife were on it. I still remember them coming to meetings. And they wanted Gary Leonard canned because they didn't like the way he was running these. And honestly, they thought he favored Leyland. And I remember getting called to a meeting in Tom Scarpati's office and said, you know, these people, the five of them are in here today, Bill McCullough or Graham, they want this guy going. Do you know him? I said, I do know him. I said, let's invite some PNC people. And we did. One was Joe McDougall. And we asked him. Is Gary Leonard important to planning and zoning? And he, they, both these members, one was Christine Berto, said he's, he's the most important person on the board. That day, we voted to reappoint Gary Leonard. All the pressure in the world didn't matter. It didn't matter that people in our party were pushing us to do this. It was that Gary Leonard was a great volunteer and he would serve PNZ well. That's what selectmen did when I used to serve, not what's happening here tonight. This is such a disappointment. This is, well, this is all a right, Marie, you've, you've had a lot of time to talk about this. We've had private conversations. I don't know, about but I'm not, this is a uh, public conversation, Peggy. Okay. You talk the whole yeah. meeting. Um, when you take a chairman of a party with the first selectman who can pick and manipulate who's going to be chairman. I was told by Peggy that the reason Ryan couldn't get back on was because they couldn't guarantee, they, she and Joan, couldn't guarantee that this bipartisan board wouldn't vote for him for chairman. It isn't their right to pick a chairman. This is a board with a history of, of uh, working together. You, you can actually look at the votes. They're never by party line. That's the way Madison should be. And that's the way it normally is. We now have a first electorate and we now have a head of a party that now is this, this year, since the last election, has totally, totally manipulated our board of ed. And now we're planning. Well, I think now that uh, Maureen, you made your comments privately and publicly, uh, as well as uh, on social media. Um, and I think that we have to recognize that um, we are elected to make these decisions, and there we're are times for change. This decision, we're, we, are, we are elected to appoint people to the, these commissions, and these are not lifetime appointments. We're not picking the chairman. We're, we're appointing people to the commission, that is absolutely and these are not these are not lifetime appointments. And so I think the idea was to try. We talked about this two years ago. That there needed to be some movement and create room for new volunteers. We had people that like want to serve. Like and so like now I'm talking like about planning and zoning. Like One of the major issues on the campaign trail 
was people are concerned about the direction of the town and development of the town. We need to engage people and set and move this town forward. This is not about the path. This is about previous decisions. It's not about Republican versus Democrat. It's about moving the town forward. We're doing our plan of conservation and development for the first time in 10 years. And we're doing an affordable housing plan that we have never done before. We need to have some fresh voices and a fresh face to that conversation. And the board of selectmen is going to be very engaged in that. And there's going to be lots of Democrats and lots of Republicans and lots of unaffiliated involved in that conversation. So this is trying to create movement within some of these boards where we've had great long-serving people. This is not to disparage the individuals or the services they made, but these are not lifetime appointments. So there has to be an opportunity to sometimes say, hey, let's have somebody else have a shot. We're moving up alternates. We're not like bringing in some random people and throwing them on the board. These people's terms expired. And we're, we are now saying, okay, let's have some new faces on these boards, move them up so we have some new voices at the table. That's all this is. So, <laughs> I, I, you know, that's my view. I've shared that with you publicly. I've shared it with you privately. And I think we all can have our opinions. You know, I'll let other board members talk. Sure, sure. So I, I think the reason for pulling this out and having a, a separate conversation about it um, is that it's a signal that this is not business as usual. This is not a practice that we've had. It is, of course, the right of the majority party to fill vacancies with members of their party um, at their discretion. Um, and both parties have done that. Um, both parties, I think, have gone to unaffiliated in, in, in different times. Uh, what is new in town is that sitting commissioners who wish to continue their service into the next term are being replaced because of the letter after their name. And I think that that's a dangerous message to send to the volunteers in town. And I think the, the, the new direction argument would carry more weight had we not just reappointed a, um, uh, a, a board of ed person who became chair immediately. Um, who aged out of the board of ed. He had been on the board of ed so long. Um, we are appointing Jude Friedman, who is a wonderful volunteer, to another, um, to another commission. So we, we have a long history of valuing the service of our dedicated volunteers. We don't have a long history of unseating volunteers who want to continue in that role. And I think that is the, the message tonight. Um, certainly, uh, it, this is not a conversation about Elliot. Uh, I've watched him in planning his own meetings. He does a fabulous job um, and, and he's a valued volunteer. But unfortunately, it's just his name on the agenda item. Um, so uh, my, my comment is the way we are doing business now has changed and I think everybody needs to understand that. Well, um, yes, the times are changing. Um, the public voted us in the office to exercise our judgment. And um, we're appointing people who we believe are moving in the direction that the public wants us to move. And so this is not about uh, uh, being negative towards anybody. This is about being positive uh, for moving in the direction that I heard people say to me, they wanted, they want us this town to move. They voted us into office and they voted us into office knowing what our campaign was about. And so I am very comfortable today exercising my judgment about who should be serving on our boards and commissions. I think that's my job and how we have done things in the past may have made sense at that point in time, but um, uh, the way we need to do business now is move forward in the directions that the public has asked us to move forward. Sorry, I have taken so much time. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, this is not at all um, anything to do with the service of somebody like Ron, who I respect immensely. Um, I, I think of Ron as a friend, so 
I, I think that is a um, huge mischaracterization that there's manipulation going on there. I guess I would ask a very simple question, which is when is change appropriate? When is change allowed? I mean, in fairness, the Republican party has been in control of this town for many, many, many years. I think we're just getting to the point where we've seen it in the last two elections where there's been some change going on in the town of Madison. I recognize change is hard and change sometimes is hard to swallow, but when is it appropriate to have change? This doesn't necessarily mean that any of the people that were moving up are bad volunteers. I even heard, I think, Noreen and Bruce out of both of your mouths at some point tonight that new faces and we're encouraging more people to get involved is a good thing. And I think that's what we're doing. Um, there is no guarantees on lifetime appointments here for people. Um, they're just not. So that's my thought. I'll just finish with this. Obviously, you can tell I was upset. I just am so disappointed what's happened to this board. It's the reason I ran for it. I've been watching it happen for the last four years, actually before you were on, Peggy. Um, I think new people are one, it's a great, great idea, but you can't talk about both sides of your mouth. You can't do what you folks did in Board of Ed and then talk about it a different way. Peggy actually told me that the reason Ron wasn't being replaced was to keep him out of the chairmanship. That's pretty blatant. That's pretty blatant. I was said, told that directly, Scott. And now I will tell you this. He said people voted for us because they like what we said during the campaign. During the campaign, we all talked about transparency. During the campaign, we all talked about being bipartisan. And I think that's what I was hoping was going to get from this board. I just never expected this blatant partisanship. I just didn't expect you to allow your elected officials like I am. I never thought you would allow your party to control your votes. Thank you. I've endured character assassination for six months. So I think with that, let's just end this discussion. I think everybody's had said what they had to say. Um, and with that, I would like to call the vote on appoint, reappointing Elliot Hitchcock to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay, and two abstentions. Okay, thank you. Moving on to item number 12. Um, need a motion to um, approve and accept the following appointments and resignations. Appointment of Peter Clemente from the Historic District Commission, alternate to full member for the term to expire January 1st, 2027. Appointment of Ron Bodenson from Planning and Zoning Commission, alternate to full member for a term to expire January 1st, 2026. Appointment of Peter Roos from Planning and Zoning Commission, alternate to full member for a term to expire January 1st, 2026. Uh, appointment of Carol Snow from the Planning and Zoning Commission, alternate to full member for a term to expire January 1st, 2026. And res uh, resignation of uh, Rich Vansell from the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Um, that a motion. Second. All right. Any discussion on the slate? Just for the record, the discussion we just had um, is the discussion that should be happens. in the record for this. For this. Um, okay. Uh, All right. No more discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, Maureen, you're you voted yay. I'm voting for the alternates to move the vote for the alternate. Okay. All right. Um, and then motion passes. Thank you very much. So I heard the part Bruce. That's big. I'll let you take it, Bruce, since I've been talking too much at this meeting. So I will move tax abatement in the amount of two thousand eight hundred twenty-eight dollars and seventy-seven cents. Second. Hey, all in favor say aye. 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 All right, great. Finally, citizens' comments. Do we have any citizens' comments from the room? Yes, please. Uh, Mike. Thank you. My name is Taylor Collier. Uh, regardless of what it is, I will just start with the next. Uh, Ron Clark's immense uh, dedication, knowledge, 
the contributions to the county. Any other uh, comments from uh, citizens? Yeah, Mr. John Rasmus for Governor's Way. I'm going to come back to uh, the referendum. Uh, why February 15th? Um, did somebody look at the calendar and say when we get the most snow? Uh, I just think I was shame on me for not knowing more about this subject beforehand, but things I heard tonight the traffic study hasn't been completed. I'm going to find it very unlikely that there's going to be negative traffic service because. We're so close to the referendum date. That bothers me. Um, you know, the whole fact that we don't have it nailed down what we're going to do with absentee ballots or less than two months away from this referendum. You know, I saw all this work and I commend you for all your work. I've been on the finance board that I served uh, for some years and I know how much work goes into it. And I know the pace stinks. Um, but uh, I heard all this work that's being done with five million dollars, and we're going to let a hundred million dollars go forward with what I think is very little public input. And again, shame on me for not being uh, closer to the subject before. The fact that we didn't have seventy-five people here today, um, I think more needs to be done to get people aware of what's going on. And I think this is going to pass, and I think it's going to be a good mistake. Any other uh, public comment in person? Anyone? Does anybody see? Uh, John Long, I have any Uh, thank you. My name is Joan Walker, 39 Stepping Stone Lane, Madison, Connecticut, and I am the chair of the Democratic Town Committee. Uh, for decades upon decades, um, the Republicans have held the majority on the Board of Selectmen and therefore had the votes to not appoint anyone that would change Republican control of chairs, leadership, committees, and commissions. When I was on the Board of Selectmen, we knew we were in the minority and never put forth a candidate that would not be approved. So not to embarrass the volunteers, but also to keep the politics out of the appointments. Each commissioner or committee member has a term. It's either four years or five years. Some members have been reappointed for several terms, but just because a member is on a commissioner committee, there is no guarantee that a reappointment will occur at the end of the term. And there shouldn't be. That is how we get entrenched and stagnant governments. It appears as though the Republicans want one standard for Republican majority and one standard for Democratic majority. And I will give you two examples. Specifically, planning and zoning is one of them. Christine Poteau was the Republican chair of PNZ who was in, uh, unanimously appointed to chair by all commissioners on both January 12th, uh, January 2012 and January 2013. On December 16th, 2013 Board of Selectmen meeting, you can look at the minutes to this meeting, Christine Poteau asked to be reappointed to BNZ because the Republican Party had voted not to reappoint her. At that point in time, the Republicans and Democrat reappointments were broken out and she asked to be added to the Republican reappointments. I was serving on the Board of Selectmen at the time and moved to open the agenda to add her name. Al Goldberg second, and our Republican counterparts voted not to, so she could not be reappointed. So this is not, this is short history if people are saying this has never happened before. The RTC chair then reached out to a Democratic commissioner about a vote for chair and wanted to talk about to the commissioner on who should be chair. This is not the only time the RTC chair influenced an appointment of the chair. In January of 2010, a Republican chair of the Economic Development Commission was replaced with a member who had been newly appointed that January. It was also my first appointment um, serving on a public board or commission. I was on the EDC as well. The Republican chair, or a Republican uh, RTC chair, sat in the audience to ensure that the vote went down according to plan. 
the old chair, the old EDC chair, had reached out to the Dems to let us know ahead of time what was happening. We offered to support him if he wanted to stay chair. He said he wanted to be a solid Republican and vote for how the party wanted the commission to be represented. During the campaign season, one of the biggest topics on knocking on the doors, which was said tonight, was how everything was running on planning and zonings and the issues before these com um, this commission. It was unusual and it, it was evident that leadership change was wanted by the voters. I called the Democratic commissioners to see if any one of them would seek out the chairmanship. One responded yes, and I let the other Democratic commissioners know. What happens in the vote of the commissioners is by the commissioners. I was giving out information and following what the voters has told us on the doors. I thank all the commissioners and committee members and the people who serve our town in public service. They do yeoman's work and put in long and tireless hours and I appreciate them. And I said that to the commissioners who I spoke to about that, including Ron Clark. I appreciated his service and I still do. I thank you for your time. That's all. Thank you. Uh, any more public comment on the line? Yeah. With that, then I'd like to uh, take a motion to okay. Yes. Okay. It says Ron, maybe maybe Ron Clark. Right. Good evening. Your uh, name, please, and address. Uh, my name is Ron Clark. I think I've heard my name bantered around uh, one or two times this evening. Um, I've watched the meeting with, with great interest, and um, well, there's a lot I could say, and I won't. Uh, a lot that was, quite frankly, I think, inaccurate. But what I will say in response, and this is spontaneous to what Joan Walker just said uh, about Republican control and so forth, I think it should be noted for the record that this controlled planning and zoning commission, the Republicans controlled that she's alluded to currently, or at least, yeah, currently, we won't lose our seats until the first of the year. But at the, as of the moment, the planning and zoning commission consists of 12 members. Five are Democrats, four are unaffiliated, and three are Republicans. So I would like to put that on the record to demonstrate how disingenuous her statements are about Republican control of boards and commissions, certainly planning and zoning in particular. And uh, I think that's all I have to say at this time. Thank you. Thank you for your service, Ron. Thank you for your comments. Any other public comment? No? Okay. So with that. Motion to adjourn. All right. Meetings adjourned.